Hello and welcome to this Assisted Dying Coalition event. I'm Polly Toynbee, I'm Vice President of Humanists UK. Uh, we have a terrific panel of people to talk today from the Assisted Dying Coalition, and we're talking about where to from here. Um, this is about the progress that we are making, and we're going to hear from some excellent speakers from around the UK and the Crown Dependencies. The Assisted Dying Coalition is um, UK and Crown Dependencies coalition of organisations working in favour of legal recognition of the right to die for individuals who have a clear, settled wish to end their life, who are terminally ill or else facing incurable suffering. The coalition was founded in 2019 by Humanists UK and My Death, My Decision. And the coalition has campaigned together on a range of issues. In 2021, the coalition published research that showed that more than more than one UK uh, citizen a week travels to Switzerland to die. Uh, this event comes in the midst of a European-wide move to tackle the issues of assisted dying head on in France. There's a citizens' convention launched, and a law is expected to be introduced by President Macron with his backing uh, by March, next month, that is. In the Republic of Ireland, a special committee is due to launch this month to, uh, I think they actually already have launched, to examine uh, assisted dying. And there are various degrees of political movement on the issue in Portugal, Italy, and Germany as well. Assisted dying is already legal in Spain, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Switzerland. So here are the organizations that are in the coalition. I'm going to ask each speaker very briefly to introduce themselves. Um, there is End of Life Choices Jersey. Uh, my name is Michael Talibard, and I'm chairman of End of Life Choices Jersey. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. My name's Emma Cooper, and I'm the convener of Friends at the End in Scotland. Hi, I'm Vicky Christian, and I'm calling you from the Isle of Man, where we have an enthusiastic, if small, group who are desperately trying to get this design lead over here. Hello, my name is Trevor Moore. Okay. I'm the chair of my, De my decision. Hi, I'm Cathy Widdick. I'm the Wales coordinator and campaigns manager from Humanist UK. Thank you. Very good. Well, we're going to kick off with uh, Emma Cooper, first of all. Thanks, Polly, and thanks everyone for coming this evening. So Friends at the End is a charity in Scotland. We campaign for legislation on assisted dying, and we also help people to understand their legal end-of-life choices, for example, around making advanced directives. We've been around for a while. Um, we're a group of academics, legal experts, um, medical experts, and we've been working with the political system in Scotland to give people that additional choice at the end of their life. We've supported three bills through the Scottish Parliament so far, two bills which haven't made it as far as the current bill has um, got to so far, and I'll come on to the reasons for, for that. And this our third bill is the closest we've got to legislation so far. I'm going to tell you a bit about the bill process in Scotland following this bill, and also what comes next, and a little bit about what we expect to be in the draft bill when it's published. So the bill in Scotland that's going forward at the moment is a member's bill. MSP Liam MacArthur is putting forward the bill <clears throat> and it's a specific process that the parliament follows which might be a little bit different to the process the government follows when it's a bill that they put forward. With Humanist Society Scotland and Dignity in Dying we fund a full-time post which sits in Liam's office. Some of you will know Amanda Ward as our former CEO uh, and she's sitting in the office to help support the passing of the bill. So the first thing, before the bill proposal was lodged, there was a public consultation which ran from September 2021 to December 2021. We had an incredible response to that, um, an absolutely extremely unusual high level of responses to that. 14,000 people and organisations and within that 78% demonstrated their support for assisted dying legislation. Some of the people who are here today might have provided the testimonies that um, fed into that consultation for which we're very grateful. And other of us, others of us here today may not have put forward that testimony, but we also might sadly know um, what, what the difficulties are that people face at the end of their life and be seeking some different alternative choices for that. 
We also had hundreds of healthcare professionals responding supportively, but often anonymously, perhaps reflecting the, the culture that we see there, where it's perhaps difficult for people to um, stand up around assisted dying. And um, that really demonstrated for us in part how well we could see assisted dying working with palliative care. So seeing those two things as going hand in hand, not being alternatives to each other. And of course, we've seen that in many countries where assisted dying is already legal. The processing for that took a, a long time, as you can imagine, 14,000 responses, um, but a summary report was published on it in September 2022, so a few months ago now. The final proposal for the bill was then lodged, so that gets put forward to Parliament, and there is one, a one-month time limit on that, during which the MSP who put forward the bill has to gain 18 signatures from across the different parties in Parliament in order for the bill to be put forward and to get the right to introduce the bill. Now, the same day that the bill was lodged, the Queen passed away and Parliament shut down for 10 days. But despite that, we gained 36 cross-party signatures um, very quickly. So that showed really good uh, support across the MSPs for this legislation. And we're seeing that uh, in our contacts with MSPs all the time. That gave Liam the right to introduce the bill. So that's a formal process that gets put forward. And after that, the bill starts to be drafted. So the bill being drafted started in October 2022, and that's ongoing at the moment. So what are we actually expecting to see in the bill? In part, it's the same provisions as the 2010 and 2013 bills that Scotland um, put forward. That means that it will be available for adults only. That's age 16 in Scotland, 18 in England and Wales, of course. It will also be only Scottish citizens who can access that. People would need to have a registered address in Scotland and be registered with a GP surgery. People will have to have mental capacity retained throughout, so they won't be able to make an advanced request for assisted dying. They have to have capacity at the time of undertaking the process. The person has to have a terminal illness diagnosis and two doctors need to independently assess both capacity and the terminal illness status. And there'll be a referral process to any specialist if there's any doubt about any of those things at all. In addition to that, it will be a self-administration by the person only. So there won't be any direct administration by a doctor, what's called euthanasia. This is about self-administration. That process might be um, orally, rectally, or via an IV setup, where the person presses the plunge themselves and starts the process. A priority in this bill is to work out how to include an opt-out clause for healthcare staff who don't wish to participate, so conscientious objection. That can be a bit tricky for us in Scotland because the regulation of healthcare professionals is reserved to Westminster, so that's one of the things that needs to be negotiated as we move forward. The major difference between this proposal compared with other bill proposals that have been put forward in Scotland is that this is for terminally ill people only. Now, the previous attempts to put forward a bill were not as tightly drawn as this one, and as a result, didn't gain the support that was needed from MSPs or stakeholders. This time, we're feeling much more confident that the bill that's been draft being drafted at the moment and the proposals that have been put forward are going to gather the support that's required. This proposal is very similar to provisions in Australia, New Zealand and many of the US states as well, where assisted dying, the term the ill, has been shown to be a safe, compassionate and effective model. And also, of course, one that gains the support needed for it to become, <coughs> excuse me, a legal legislated for. As in those countries uh, and within our bill, there will be strict monitoring and reporting procedures. Um, in place so that we're making sure that every assisted death is closely safeguarded and what the kind of um, provisions that are being put in place for that are being worked out at the moment and that will actually put in place some provisions some safeguards that actually aren't there at the moment so the legislation will actually provide a lot of clarity for people. We've been fortunate that the proposal for the bill has been well informed by the work of a medical advisory group that's 12 healthcare professionals across a number of relevant specialities, including palliative care, mental capacity, um, experts, for example. And they did a really deep dive into how assisted dying um, works in other places and how it might work in practice in Scotland. It's been helpful that we've seen a recent shift in medical opinion since the previous attempts as well. So, for example, the British Medical Association and the Royal College of Physicians uh, and others have moved to a neutral stance on assisted dying. They're not against it anymore. And that's really helped to open up discussion and debate. 
We actually had an event recently that we held for around 100 junior doctors who came and listened to some of the proposals, had an opportunity to ask questions and debate some of the safeguards and other questions around it as well. Assisted dying is, of course, an opt-in process, and we know it won't be for everybody. It's really for us uh, about choice, about having that choice at end of life. Um, and we know that from other places, around a third of those who go through the process to access assisted dying actually die naturally of their condition. They don't access that. But we found that it really gives comfort and reassurance in those final days. So uh, the next steps for this are to continue drafting the bill, introduce it, um, hopefully, well, at some point this year. After that, the uh, there will be committee scrutiny of the bill and a report produced. There will then be a stage one vote of the MSPs. At the moment, we expect that to pass. Um, and if successful, we then go through a stage two process where there are opportunities to put forward amendments and it gets signed off by that lead committee. And then there is the stage three final vote and eventually it goes to royal assent. So we know that the vast majority of the Scottish public support having the choice of an assisted death and that there's that good support in Parliament too. We're feeling very optimistic about the future. Um, and we do know, however, of course, that those who are opposed to this are also well organised and we're finding an increasing number of um, news articles and um, misinformation perhaps on occasions as well being put forward by those groups who are against this. We really want to see a discussion about this, which is well-informed, evidenced, uh, rational, and helps us put forward the right kind of bill and process for this. If anyone here isn't already a member of Friends at the End, and I'm sure plenty of you aren't, then do please consider joining um, or encouraging others too, but also consider whether there's any support or uh, other things that you might be able to offer us over time. We're really happy to hear from people, whether they're members or not. We're a really small organisation. We've remained deliberately that way. We're a strategic organisation and you know, we punch well above our weight for a small charity. Um, this is a really important couple of years for us and I'm really excited about what we're going to hopefully see go through the Scottish Parliament. Thanks, Polly. Thank you very much. Um, I realise uh, before we go to everybody else, I was supposed to lay out the basic arguments for the case. Emma's already made them pretty well. Uh, I think looking broadly, at the incredible support that there is for this and has been for a very long time now. What people realize is that we are all going to die and uh, there is no point in, in fearing that inevitability, but there's every reason to be terrified of being forced to exit through the torture chamber. And how we die really matters, not just to ourselves, but for all of those who have to watch our ending. And if it's a painful one, that's excruciating. I mean, you see in all those death notices, people say, you know, peacefully in her bed. Uh, and often you ask yourself, well, I wonder if that's really true. Is that just politely saving friends from what may have been days or weeks, or months of excruciating pain and, and horror and humiliation? On average, Research shows that 17 people a day are dying in terrible pain that can't be relieved, even by the very best of palliative care. I mean, the arguments for the right to avoid unbearable suffering at the end of your life have been very well rehearsed. We had private members bills most recently from Lord Faulkner and then from Baroness Meacher, um, which do a huge amount of public support, but they've been successfully blocked largely by a religious lobby in whose doctrines only God uh, can ordain how and when we die. I mean, for a long time, the public has, has been outspokenly in favour of it. Uh, current polling shows 84% in favour, and that includes actually 80% of the religious and 86% of people living with disabilities, because people often say, oh, this will discriminate against, against those people, but that's not how they feel. New Zealand's End of Life Choice Act is one of Jacinda Ardern's great progressive legacies. And there are um, 11 US states and six Australia, all six Australian states that have passed assisting dying laws, along with Canada, Colombia, and six European countries. French President Emmanuel Macron set up a series of citizens' assemblies, and he is promising uh, to, uh, a, a law shortly. In Ireland, too, is uh, launching a special committee on the subject, and other countries are rapidly following. I mean, it does, of course, make the right, because a lot of people are doing, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. 
Uh, the case against mostly includes fear that the old and the frail are going to feel prevailed on to end their lives to save their children the burden of caring for them, or indeed to save their inheritance. And obviously there are raw memories of Harold Shipman and the Gosport Hospital mass murder where the inconvenient elderly were simply got rid of uh, with no say so whatever. And um, But doctors and judges assessing someone's mental capacity, people fear, might often miss undiagnosed depression. Could this be a slippery slope towards um, a kind of cost-saving euthanasia at a time when the elderly are costing the state more and more? But of course, no law can ever be 100% safe. But when you consider our attitudes towards death at the moment, we're pretty callous towards enormous numbers of very avoidable deaths about which there's very disgracefully little outrage. And the fact that there might once in a while be some questionable case through an assisted dying law should be put up against how we treat people now. I mean, each year an estimated 6,500 terminally ill people try to take their own lives in often quite horribly bungled ways. Uh, lots of people travel to Switzerland, very depressing Dignitas Clinic, not really where people want to die if they have a choice. Very expensive, too expensive for most. Uh, and it often means dying sooner than you would if you're, uh, as you have to be fit for travel. Age UK, but on this question of deaths that might be avoidable or deaths that we don't seem to care about. Age UK reports that 28,800 older people died in 2021 without receiving the care they were waiting for. They were waiting for social care and they never got it. And they were neglected deaths, uh, greeted pretty much with public ap apathy, rather in the way that I'm afraid that the shocking rise in infant mortality is also not a great cause of public out, out, uh, outcry. And the work of Sir Michael Marmot shows how many people, how many excess deaths there are due to poverty, people dying very much younger uh, just, just because of their social status. So I think we have to put any fears that people have uh, about this into the context of a very, very callous society. The idea that people who want to die are not allowed to die while thousands and thousands of people are dying who shouldn't be. And palliative care in England is very good. Office of Health and Economics warns though that about 92,000 people a year who need palliative care actually don't get it. So we want a lot more exactly as Emma said, work very closely with the palliative care uh, people, it's, it, it's services that should go together. It's a matter of choice and making sure that everybody gets the very best. Um, but the point is palliative care doesn't always work. My mother died of cancer uh, in excruciating pain, begging to die, asking the GP. And the GP said, can't do it anymore since Harold Shipman, you know, every ampule is counted. There's no way that we can, we can help you. And, uh, she was, um, you know, I watched her die the last few months of her life uh, in absolutely needless pain. And I think so many people now have this experience with their parents or other people in their family or people they love. And they know my mother had the best palliative care, that it doesn't always work, that morphine is not a wonder drug. People often have an idea, well, it'll be all right, I'll drift off in a kind of daze of morphine. It's a pretty horrible drug, it can reduce hallucinations and completely appalling uh, constipation. So people end the last months of their lives thinking about the state of their bowels, as opposed to meaning of life or how I think higher things or love of family. Um, it's, it, it's a pretty nasty way to die. And people often don't realize that. Um, I think that, um, you know, the whole point of this is that there's a nasty piece of research that, you know, came out called the inescapable truth. And I'm not going to list here because it's really almost too horrible, I think. Uh, of how the very best palliative care doesn't save everyone. And it has the evidence of the sorts of ways people die, their own bodies rotting, um, nobody being able to do anything about it. And 
you know, it's a you've got to be pretty strong to read it, but it's very convincing. And it's written by with the evidence of all the people who know and who work with uh, end of life care. And, um, I, you know, case after case uh, of uh, these 17 people a day who are dying in agony. I think that, you know, the myth behind died peacefully in her sleep is beginning to be exploded. I think people see now uh, what actually happens and how you can't always help everybody get the good death that they deserve. Uh, and once the law allows a dignified choice, that people can die in comfort knowing they could escape in case the pain got uh, agonizing. As Emma says, all the evidence is that people may ask for it, but when it comes to it, it's a kind of protection against the worst, but most of them don't actually use it. They just want to know it's there. And so uh, we are hoping that more and more people will join these campaigns around the country. And we're now going to hear from our other speakers uh, from around different parts of the country and the campaigns growing more and more successful. Uh, and I'm quite sure that we're gonna get there, at least before I die, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So our next speaker is Michael uh, Talibad. Uh, from the End of Life Choices Jersey. Great. I'm going to give a little history of the Jersey process, uh, hoping that this might be useful to other groups who are perhaps not so far down the path. And after that, I'll take a brief look at the present state of affairs over here and the expected future. So our campaign began five years ago in early 2018, and it will take at least another at least another three years to complete. Now, there's every reason to believe that there was already majority public support for assisted dying before we began, but this was mostly dormant and unspoken. Therefore, our first task was to raise public awareness of this as a live political issue. So we walked the streets of St. Helier with placards and leaflets. I well remember getting our T-shirts printed. We appeared on local media, print, radio, and television. We showed the film Endgame in our art center. We got Phil Cheetle of My Death, My Decision over to speak to some states members. That was useful. And the great Sylvan Luli of Dignitas has come here two or three times to speak in debates. He is a star. While all this was going on, and as we began to see strong support, the second task was to prove that it was there. So we commissioned a professional public opinion poll with an excellent structure of questions borrowed from My Death, My Decision. And shortly afterwards, we polled the island's medical profession in the same way. And both polls produced very encouraging results. The third task, though in fact it had begun already whilst one and two were ongoing, the third task was to get states members on board, that's like your MPs, um, and for there to be a proposition brought before the, the Assembly. So we contacted and met a few members that we knew were with us, and we went to see our health minister. In this, we were fortunate that, in, that Jersey has in place a system where any petition of a sufficient number is entitled to a ministerial response. I don't know what the UK equivalent of that might be. Anyway, the process I've been describing was started and carried on mostly by my organization, End of Life Choices Jersey. But after a while, other bodies such as Dignity in Dying and Humanists began to join in. Our then health minister, since ousted in an election, was personally opposed to any assisted dying, though he was careful never quite to say so. We met him several times, and others also applied pressure. Uh, his response in the end was to form a citizen's jury hoping I would guess for an ambiguous verdict. But that jury was properly set up and well conducted uh, 
And the outcome was, of course, highly positive. And this was what gave the final push to our government to bring a proposition to the state's assembly. We lobbied them a bit, but we already knew the support was there. And so in November 2021, the states of Jersey voted by a ratio of two to one in favor of assisted dying legislation. First part of the British Isles to do that. It was an historic moment. I was personally quite surprised that the UK media took so little notice of it. Since then, we have had an election here, but there is every reason to believe that assisted dying still commands a clear majority, clear majority support in our legislature, possibly even more so now than last year. It remains to turn that important in principle decision into detailed legislation. The civil servants carrying out this task, I have met them, are pretty good, but it all takes time. Their first move has been to conduct two further rounds of consultation. The first, consisting of a few public meetings in parish halls and, in, and an invitation to write in, was rather a waste of time in my view, but of course we took part. The second, a far more substantial and necessary move was to publish a set of proposals, a sort of white paper, you might call it, and to invite comments. Naturally, we took a full part in this, as did My Death, My Decision and other helpful bodies, as well, of course, as some opponents. We found we could praise much of their work. It is broader, for example, than what is currently proposed in Scotland. But there is a big mistake running all through these Jersey proposals, namely the provision of two different routes, as they call them, to an assisted death, where route two, which imposes many extra burdens and delays, is for those who do not have a six month to live prognosis, but only unbearable suffering. <laughs> only the suffering, such as the evil of DID, it is now our prime task to get this discrimination removed. I believe we will, and we have to try. The official timescale going forward, which has already begun to be extended, is as follows. To publish in February 2023, that is right now, a report on our feedback to those proposals. Well, that has just been put forward two months to the end of April. I hope this means they have a lot of redrafting to do, and I hope this redrafting involves abandoning the two routes approach. We will see. They then give themselves a year to draft the law, and if that is passed, then a further year to set it all up and train the professionals. They say they aim to get it all up and running by the end of 2025 but I'll bet it's gonna be more like 2026 or 27. Still, in some shape or form, it will happen. And please believe in your jurisdictions too, one day it will happen. Thank you. That was incredibly encouraging. Um, you know, I suppose people never think of Jersey as being this incredibly remarkably progressive place. And it's very good to hear that it really is. And uh, so I think other campaigners are going to be much encouraged by, by your experience. Now we're going to hear from Vicky Christian uh, of Let Me Choose from the Isle of Man. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Polly. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to update you on what's been going on in the Isle of Man regarding assisted dying legislation. Um, first of all, I'd like to give you a, a short introduction to how the Isle of Man works, how its parliament works. Um, because we are not, and we never have been part of the UK. And so um, we're not represented at, at Westminster, so we make our own laws. We're self-governing British Crown dependency with its own parliament and government and laws. The UK government on behalf of the Crown is responsible for international relations. The King, who's our Lord of Man, is the Manx head of state and is represented on the island by a Lieutenant Governor. 
the island's people are British citizens. The island's government is consulted before the, agree, the UK agrees to extend its ratification of any international treaty to include the Isle of Man and is responsible for our defence, for which we make a contribution to the UK. So the Isle of Man has a ministerial system of government and its political head is the chief minister who is nominated by Tinwald from amongst his members. The chief minister selects the ministers who have responsibility for major government departments and they together with the chief minister form the council of ministers which is in effect the Manx cabinet. The Manx legislature, Tinwald, consists of two chambers or branches. The House of Keys has 24 members elected for a five-year term in two seat constituencies by the whole island. As the island has a population of only around 85,000 people, the constituencies are small, and this makes it easy to get to know our representatives and make contact with them over issues of concern. The Legislative Council has 11 members, including the President of Tinwald, the non-voting Attorney General, and the Bishop of Soda and Man, who does have a vote. The other eight members are elected by the House of Keys. They're in joint sittings of the Tinwall Court, where the two branches sit together. Prior to the last general election, which took place in 2021, uh, we, Tinwall passed a very progressive abortion bill, which has since been enacted. And since then, in the 2021 election, the Manx Labour Party won two seats and the Liberal Vanning Party won one seat. All the remaining 21 seats were won by independents. Most Manx politicians stand for the election as independents though. And the influence of political parties isn't nearly as strong here as it is in the UK. So much of Manx legislation develops through uh, consensus amongst the members and so is much less adversarial than the UK parliament. However, having said that, the current House of Keys would appear to be more progressive than the last one, which one would hope would be of help in the current campaign for assisted dying legislation. Tinwald, the two branches of the legislature together, Tinwald has discussed the issues around assisted dying several times in the past. In May 2003, uh, MHK John Rimmington asked for leave to introduce a private member's bill. At that time, an amendment was passed to set up a select committee of five members to take written and oral evidence. And their extensive report was published in 2006, and I think quietly put on a shelf and forgotten about, as is the way with committee reports, unfortunately. Since then, there have been several petitions to Tinwald and affirmative motions by junior Tinwald representing younger people who incidentally are able to vote at 16 over here. In February 2015, the Honourable Member for Russian, Duan Watterson, also asked for leave to introduce a bill to amend the law with respect to assisted dying, which was not supported then. Duan Watterson is now the Speaker of the House of Keys, and I'm very grateful to him because he's very helpful and encouraging in our campaign. In May 2021, Ireland Global Research carried out an opinion survey on views about end of life issues. They specifically asked about a change of the law to allow mentally competent, terminally ill residents the option of seeking assistance in their death. Respondents were also told safeguards would be embedded in such legislation. Now, this was carried out, I believe, on the other Crown dependencies as well. In the Isle of Man, 65% of res respondents strongly supported the introduction of the legislation will only 8% strongly opposed to it. So, on the 14th of June, 2022, Dr. Alex Allenson, MHK, gained leave to introduce a private member's bill. A private member's bill doesn't form part of the government's legislative programme, so it isn't developed or endorsed by the government and is a matter for members of Tinwald, both at policy and legislative level. On the 1st of December last year, Dr. Allenson launched a consultation on assisted dying, which ran throughout that month 
and closed on the 26th of January this year. That consultation was one of the largest ever seen on the Isle of Man, and it gathered over 3,000 responses, demonstrating a huge range of opinions. Dr. Allison is hoping to be able to publish a report summarizing these responses to the consultation as early as next month, and following that, hopes to have a draft bill put before the House of Keys before the summer recess this year. The House of Keys has to first consider the bill before it goes to the Legislative Council. We very much hope that it won't be sent to a committee, as this will just delay any progress. As one of the members said to me, that's just kicking it into the long grass and they don't want that. It will have to pass, of course, through various stages before being signed in Tinwald, in Tinwald Court, before going to London for royal assent and then back to the Isle of Man to become an act of Tinwald. Dr. Allenson says that assisted dying is a personal choice and that it is now up to the House of Keys to determine the legislation which will be able to provide a choice to the people that they represent. I should also add a little bit of extra news that last night there was a public hustings for candidates for the four vacant seats currently on the Legislative Council. Almost all of the candidates say they are in favour of assisted dying as long as safeguards are in place. A very pleasing outcome. So where do we go from here? Well, in three weeks time, the chair of my death, my decision, Trevor Moore, uh, will be making his first visit to the Isle of Man to address a Tinwald briefing in the Tinwald building. Most of the members of the House of Keys and the Legislative Council are expected to attend and I anticipate a lively debate. During his visit, Trevor will also address a public meeting and speak to the island media. Local supporters will continue to contact, contact their constituency members, write letters to the local papers, and will demonstrate outside Tinwald whenever there's a debate about giving Manx residents this opportunity to have an assisted death at a time and place of their choosing. Then it will be down to the members of Tinwald to make the right decisions. You can be very assured that we, in the local group of My Death, My Decision, will be reminding them at every single opportunity that their constituents are eager for the island to have an assisted dying act on the statute book before long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, that's really encouraging uh, very encouraging indeed and now we're going to hear from trevor moore himself who you've just been talking about from my death my decision trevor thank you polly uh, yes my name is trevor moore i'm chair of my death my decision and we're campaigning for an assisted dying law that will allow those who are terminally ill and those who are suffering unbearably from incurable conditions to have help to die when and where they choose um i I want to just put things in context a bit as to how we've got to where we are in England and Wales now. It's um, really frustrating when we look around at uh, Jersey and Isle of Man and Scotland to see the progress they're making because we're much further behind. Um, I first of all wanted to remind ourselves of some of the valiant campaigners who've actually got us partly to where we are um, today because um, I do think it's important that we remember what the campaign is all about, which is people and compassion for people uh, in unfortunate circumstances. And here you have the key players in, in uh, court cases from time to time, Diane Pretty, Debbie Purdy, Tony Nicklinson, Paul Lamb, Noel Conway, and Phil Newby. And Phil is in advanced stage of motor neurone disease. And I know in, in recent times has been taking part in um tv documentary um about assisted dying so we really owe a debt to these people who really have put a spotlight spotlight on their lives in in often challenging circumstances um so De diane pretty was the first one to bring a case and she was arguing that um the ban on assisted dying was in breach of her right to life under the uh European Convention on Human Rights, which had been incorporated in our Human Rights Act. Uh, she was unsuccessful both at, in, in our uh, domestic courts and also at the European Court of Human Rights, although they did acknowledge that 
uh, potentially her rights to private life under Article 8 could be breached. It was nevertheless for uh, governments to decide how and when they might introduce an assisted dying law, uh, which was obviously very frustrating for, for Diane. And then in 2009, Debbie Purdy brought a case um, which went uh, to what was then the House of Lords. She wanted clarification that if her husband Omar uh, accompanied her to Dignitas in Switzerland, that um, he wouldn't be prosecuted for assisted suicide. Uh, and the House of Lords said, well, actually, we agree with you that the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions must issue some guidance on the public uh, interest factors that would be taken into account in whether to prosecute someone. Uh, the DPP at the time, one Keir Starmer, um, issued that guidance, which has remained in place. And it's actually not satisfactory in many ways, and I haven't got time to go into it now, but um, many of you will have heard of the um, case of Sue Lawford last year, who accompanied out of pure compassion someone to Dignitas uh, in Switzerland and was arrested on her return, uh, all very um, over the top. All her devices were taken and uh, her car, uh, credit cards and her passport and so on. You can Google Sue Lawford and you will find many media reports on that. Sue incidentally tells me that actually she found Dignitas to be a wonderful place and the staff were really, really uh, empathetic. So that's good to know. But it shouldn't be the case that you can only go there if you've got the uh, physical ability and the financial means as well. In uh, 2014, the Supreme Court uh, revisited the human rights aspect of this in the Tony Nicholson case. I expect many of you will remember Tony. He had locked-in syndrome and he could only communicate by uh, looking, uh, making eye movements at particular letters, which his wife, Jane, became very accomplished at translating into words. And his case was initially rejected in the High Court. He died, unfortunately, in 2012, shortly after that decision. But his wife, Jane, and uh, our patron, indeed, Paul Lamb, uh, who'd been paralyzed more or less completely from the neck down, uh, took up the case on appeal to the Supreme Court. Again, the Supreme Court rejected uh, any declaration about incompatibility of our law with um, Article 8 of the European Convention. And they said, it's for Parliament. That's the appropriate form, forum for considering changes to law on this particular issue. There are many points, however, in the Nicholson case that are worth uh, poring over. Some really uh, helpful points. I've only got time to mention one now, which I think is particularly interesting. Lord Newberger compared the issue of assisted dying to other end-of-life dilemmas. And he suggested that withdrawing life-sustaining treatment, which you probably all know uh, the current law permits, you can, you can request the withdrawal, as he described it, is a more drastic interference in that person's life and, and a more extreme moral step than assisting in a suicide. So in other words, really, we, we, we've, we've already crossed that line. Uh, we allow that. Uh, we allow the autonomy for me to say I no longer want life-sustaining treatment. And really, um, this is not a huge step. We have to keep reminding ourselves that prohibition on assisted suicide is assistance to do something which is itself is perfectly legal. It's really uh, quite something to get your mind around. In 2015, uh, Rob Maris MP introduced the assisted dying number two bill. Uh, and that was the first time that MPs really got the chance to uh, debate the issue. It followed the format of previous bills introduced by Lord Faulkner and adopted the uh, what I would call a six month termly ill rule, which said that only people who uh, had been had that prognosis could benefit from from the law. But in any event, it was defeated roundly uh, 330 against and only 118 for. Notwithstanding that, though, uh, successive attempts through the courts came from the other people you saw in the pictures there, Noel Conway, Paul Lamb, I've already mentioned, and uh, Bill Newby. Uh, they were all unsuccessful. Interestingly, in Phil's case, uh, 
Mrs Justice May and Lord Irwin said, in our judgment, there are some questions which plainly and simply cannot be resolved by a court as no objective single correct answer can be said to exist. So all roads lead to Parliament, because unlike in countries such as Austria, Canada and Germany, uh, court cases are not going to be the catalyst for law change in England and Wales. Uh, meanwhile, as has already been mentioned, I think by Emma, there, there were been some useful changes of view by medical bodies such as the British Medical Association and the Royal College of Physicians. And that really matters because many MPs who voted against the Maris Bill said, in part, it was due to the fact that medical professionals were opposed. Uh, and maybe that would make them or help them change their minds now. And then many of you will know that Baroness Meacher introduced her private members bill in the um, House of Lords uh, in 2021. Its format broadly followed that of the Maris bill. Um, it never achieved a second reading because, uh, sorry, it never went to committee because it ran out of time as pr private members bills often do. Um, there were aspects of that that we, we wholeheartedly supported the, uh, the idea of having an assisted dying law. There were amendments we were proposing to the Meacher bill, but they never got to the, to the committee stage for them to be heard. So we have this, um, what I call an unbreakable loop of twisted logic, because the government repeatedly says that um, it has no intent, intention to change the law in this area as it considers that it's a conscience matter, but nevertheless, it won't either allow time for legislation to be heard. So there's this sort of unbreakable loop. Uh, we have had a sort of slight chink of light in that uh, Steve Bryan MP announced a health and social care committee inquiry into assisted dying last December. And that's underway at the moment. The date for submissions was the 20th of January, my death, my decision, uh, obviously made a written submission, but they also invited uh, individual survey responses. Many of you, I hope, uh, filled that in. Um, astonishingly, they received over 63,000 uh, individual responses, and that's going to take them some time uh, to digest be because they've said it's a qualitative survey, not a quantitative survey, which means that in those narrative boxes that you all um, have the chance to fill in, uh, they're going to have to go through that and sort of synthesize them into uh, conclusions. There were some really concerning uh, flaws in the survey and the way it was carried out, not least they couldn't monitor multiple submissions. So um, Emma's already said that Scotland had over 14,000 submissions, but they were able to identify that a large number of those had come from pretty much similar IP addresses. Uh, they haven't been able to do that in the Health and Social Care Committee, uh, as far as we know. Um, there doesn't seem to be a sort of protocol for what happens with this committee. It's up to them uh, to make, make their own rules. They are going to be calling for oral evidence. They are visiting Oregon, but rejected an offer from Dr. Stephanie Green, um, a, a big uh, friend of My Death, My Decision, to visit Canada. Um, one of the questions in the individual survey for the uh, Health and Social Care Committee was about appetite for a citizens' assembly, which has already been mentioned. Uh, I think Polly mentioned that there's one ongoing in France, and Michael mentioned that there was a jury in Jersey. And I would say that given that the current impasse lies with politicians, um, it would be good if the inquiry came out with um, a recommendation that we have a citizens assembly in this country, because that will take it away from the politicians, uh, the political bloc, if, if um, it was set up on the basis that it would be followed, its outcome would be followed through. So maybe the will of the people will, uh, will will rule the day. In France, they've had an indicative vote in their assembly, and it came out at uh, close to 75% supporting an assisted dying law, which matches fairly closely what happened in Jersey. 
Um, so, um, you know, all, all uh, expectations that would be that we'd have a similar thing occurring over here. So I will leave it at that point. I'll just remind you that you're very welcome indeed to join My Death, My Decision and help us with our campaign. Uh, do Google us and you'll, you'll come up with all, all sorts of information. Uh, we really depend on and get enthused and energised by uh, support from people like you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. That was that was really fascinating. And now it's uh, Kathy Roddick from Humanists UK. Thanks, Polly. Um, it would be nice to be able to give you an update from Wales, as I uh, represent Wales Humanists, but unfortunately this isn't a devolved issue. And so we are uh, in exactly the same position as England on this. Um, but to look globally um, at the situation, um, and have a sum up of some of the arguments uh, for uh, this law change that you've heard already. Um, to start by looking at in 2012, only 133 million people around the world lived in countries where an assisted dying law um, gave them access uh, to that facility. But now that's increased almost threefold to 370 million people worldwide, and that includes Austria, Canada, Colombia, Spain, New Zealand, the US states of Oregon, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Maine, New Jersey, New Mexico, and Vermont, um, and the Australian states, Victoria, Western Australia, Tasmania, Queensland, South Australia, and New South Wales. In every one of these countries, assisted dying continues to be strongly supported by the general public. Germany and Italy have also had their prohibitions on assisted dying struck down by the courts and have seen some people have a court approved assisted death, but neither country has yet legislated to create a scheme where such deaths can happen. Um, Michael gave you a really positive update on what's been happening in Jersey um, and we hope to see that bill pass um, and support that transition to a law there. Um, and I um, also gave you an update from Scotland, um, where we hope soon to see a bill and a private member's bill also in the Isle of Man. France and the Republic of Ireland are also pursuing inquiries and citizens' juries into assisted dying. England and Wales are slipping behind our neighbours many, and many other parts of the world, and therefore it's time for action now on these. In terms of how the jurisdictions are working internationally, Assisted dying has been legal in Switzerland for over 80 years. This isn't a new uh, law, it's not a new trend. It's been going for such a long time that we're able to look at these other countries and see what works and see what safeguards are required. The US state of Oregon has had an assisted dying law for 25 years. Belgium, Netherlands uh, legalized it two decades ago and assisted dying in these countries works. There's some scaremongering from people who oppose it, but that's clearly false. People argue that permitting assisted dying would be a scope creep to wider laws that would start to infringe on personal autonomy, or that lives of those who are mentally or physically disabled would become seen as less valued. It's simply not true. And from the jurisdictions where assisted dying has been permitted for some time, the evidence is clear. Oregon's law is almost identical to their law from 25 years ago, no goat creep. One of the reasons we're so clearly advocating for a law permitting assisted dying for terminally ill and those intolerably suffering is because we want to get the right law from the start. The law that supports the view that the population, a law that would have provided the right answer for some of the cases um, that were mentioned previously by Trevor. It's true that Canada's laws have changed from when assisted dying was first introduced in 2016, but these staggered changes have only come about due, due to Canadian MPs legislating for less than what was required by their Supreme Court. Most changes about assisted dying around the world happened through campaigns that led to votes and legislative change in Parliament. In Canada, their Supreme Court in 2015 ruled that Canadian adults was, who were suffering intolerably and enduring uh, and enduringly have the constitutional right to a doctor's assistance in dying. For Canada, it was an issue of constitutional rights that were being denied to citizens. So in 2016, lawmakers introduced a bill um, to bring that judgment into force. 
but they only introduced it initially for terminally ill. So it did not meet the suffering intolerably and enduringly criterion of the ruling. That the courts then ruled again in 2019 that the law should be changed to fit the original ruling. So Canada's actually taken over eight years to implement a law that was ordered by the Supreme Court in 2015. It's not scope creep, it's just delivering what they'd originally promised. We, however, would advocate the approach taken elsewhere, such as Victoria and Australia, where the law change is given time to secure the right support, safeguards, consistent training and processes, and that would be the most safest and stable approach to a good law. The current situation in the UK is discriminating against physically disabled people and those on lower incomes, as the only way to secure a safe assisted death is to travel independently to a jurisdiction which permits it, such as Switzerland. This can be impossible, not only for financial reasons, but also the barriers put in place for those with disabilities to independently travel, as seen in the case of Sharon Johnson last year. Barriers to her personal choice and the impact on those helping her achieve her wishes, being that they were then put under arrest for six months on their return to the UK for showing compassion and helping somebody achieve something that there, there was their own personal wish. This can't continue. We need to respect personal choice. At present, only the wealthy or the physically able or those with reliable personal support can access assisted dying services. And that's simply not fair. Assisted dying and palliative care are two sides of the same coin. They work together to complement each other. Switzerland, the Netherlands, Belgium, they regularly rank incredibly high when it comes to healthcare and palliative care. In fact, Switzerland's healthcare system often ranks as the best country in the world. In the Netherlands, palliative care provisions have multiplied since legalized assisted dying. And in Belgium in 2002, euthanasia legislation was passed with a palliative care bill, doubling the public funding for palliative care. Both palliative care and assisted dying can be part of a patient-centered approach to end-of-life care. And assisted dying will always remain personal choice under any law. Britain has one of the best palliative care systems in the world. Of course, there's always room for improvement, but we do need compassionate assisted dying law today. Just to touch upon the religious argument that there is sanctity of life and that life must be never be taken before its natural time and doctors should not play God. On that point, human life is valuable and should be respected, but we should also consider a person's quality of life. What is important to that individual is, may not just be being alive, it might be having a life, one where we can still enjoy the pleasures and carry out our ambitions. If those things no longer exist without intolerable suffering, then we should be able to have that choice at end of life. So if we look at autonomy and freedom as the key elements of the debate in the case of the terminally ill or incurably suffering patient, assisted dying can be a merciful release for everyone involved and can console those to the patient that were able to fulfill their loved one's wishes. Ideally, decisions would be discussed by all parties involved, but at the end of the day, it should be up to the individual to have say over their own body. We should ask whether it's right to force other people to stay alive against their wishes just for our own sake. We, of course, support the, uh, the case for medical pra practitioners um, to be able to conscious, conscientiously object to being um, participants uh, in any assisted dying process. And it's important to note that the BMA announced it was uh, transferring across to a neutral position on assisted dying. So there's support within the medical community for this. Experience around the world and evidence from people impacted here in the UK shows there's no valid reason to delay any further. And that there is a clear will in England and Wales to move towards a law permitted, permitting assisted dying and we have the knowledge available to provide the best route to achieving that law and the necessary safeguards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, that's a rousing appeal. It is really the last frontier as we have gained more and more right over our own right as individuals to do what we like with our own body over the years. Over my years, I've seen one frontier after another. Uh, 
regained for the individual to make their own choice. And this really is the last major one I think left. And we're winning the, we've won the argument. We just need to win the legislators over. And um, now it's going to be time for your questions. And um, do put your questions in the chat box um, with an awful lot to think about, both in terms of the fundamentals, the fundamentals of the issue itself, but also in the nature of campaigning, how to campaign, um, how to join your own local groups and sustain them, as Trevor said. These are very small, small groups on the whole, uh, doing fantastic work, who managing to get all these major step forwards, steps forward on legislative change out of sheer determination and persistence. But they need support. They need donations and they need people to join and they need people to help them. So do sign up with any of these groups in your local area. The, the first question for Michael and Dickie is what are the sizes of uh, Jersey and uh, the Isle of Man's populations? And are there any concerns that you will not have enough willing healthcare professionals to deliver assisted dying? Right, then... Uh... Uh, hi, uh, we've got 85,000 people round out in the land and we haven't any concerns that, that we will have enough. I'm sure we'll have enough uh, medical people prepared to take part. Thank you. And, and Michael? Uh, sorry, I'm getting a message that I can't start my video. Oh, it's okay, I can, right. Uh, the population of Jersey is 108,000, more or less. Um, we don't have any worry about healthcare professionals, because um, we we polled them and lots and lots and lots of them are supportive. Some of them very supportive. Uh, we are doctors and nurses on our own committee. And um, in any case, to, to run an assisted dying system, you don't need every doctor to be on board, except, of course, they have to refer their patients. But to actually be directly involved, you only need a few dedicated and specially trained individuals, and we're confident that they will be in place. That's very encouraging. So another one for Michael and Vicky. Uh, do the Crown dependencies see the requirement for royal assent as an insurmountable hurdle for their legislative process? I, I haven't ever heard of any laws that have been passed on the Isle of Man being refused royal assent. I think it's just a question of how long it takes to achieve it. Uh, the Abortion Act was sent to London and took an awfully long time, but it did eventually come through. So we would hope that the same would be apply for this legislation. Michael? Um, well, similarly, I, I think if a law is passed in the States of Jersey Assembly, then it would take a very brave person in Whitehall to block it because um, that would cause a huge constitutional crisis. Uh, I've seen a question here now. I can now see them, uh, Nathan. Uh, this is for Emma. Um, it's disappointing that the proposed Scottish law excludes intolerable and incurable suffering. Can you explain what's wrong with the Swiss law that's worked so well for decades? And there has been indeed a divide between certain groups that are only going for a very limited terminally ill uh, uh, right to die and uh, this coalition. Thanks, Polly. So um, I'm not going to comment on the, the Swiss law, but to clarify what the proposal is in Scotland is perhaps most helpful. So we have a, a definition in law of terminal illness, and it's actually really quite broad, perhaps broader than people might um, think it is. So I'm going to read it out. It says that um, they have a progressive disease that is expected to cause their death. So the bill in Scotland doesn't explicitly um, exclude intolerable suffering. Um, what it does is it keeps quiet on it. So it doesn't make it a legal requirement for somebody to have to demonstrate that they are suffering intolerably for them to be able to access an assisted death. So um, in Scotland, they can they can access an assisted death before they reach the point of being able to demonstrate that they are suffering intolerably. So that, that's the reason why the Scottish proposal um, doesn't explicitly state that. I there, hope is that's no time limit. there is no expected moment. Uh, no, I have to say it's within a certain amount of time of expected death. 
No, that's right. Um, the proposal in Scotland doesn't say that somebody has to be X months or years from um, uh, death from a terminal illness. It says that they have to have been um, a, a progressive disease that is expected to cause their death in essence. That's Michael, right. Want to come in. Yeah, I, I, I know we shouldn't disagree since we're all theoretically on the same side, but I do worry that that Scottish proposal is, is too limited. I really do. Um, unbearable suffering where there, there is no expected, no particular date or length of time predicted is in many ways a worse burden to bear. If somebody is told you're suffering badly, but you'll be dead in six months or 12, that's awful. But if someone who's suffering equally badly is told we've no idea how many years this may last, that is worse. And our, our compassion should go out to that person even more than to other candidates for assisted dying. That's my view, I'm sorry. In other words, there, there should be no mention of, of um, predictions of death in, in, in the laws we pass at all. That's my view, sorry. That's okay, thanks, Colin. Any of the other of you want to come in on that? Trevor, do you have a, a view on that, on the Scottish formulation? Yes, we, we've uh, very much been campaigning for a broader law along the lines um, of that described by Michael. Um, I do think uh, it was interesting in Canada before, um, I, I think Cathy was explaining how the law evolved there, but before they, um, as it were, rectified their law because it wasn't uh, in accordance with the initial Supreme Court decision, death had to be reasonably foreseeable. Um, uh, which people took as meaning that you you know you had to be terminally ill, but there were actually court cases on that that said it could be as much as eight or ten years. You know, it it, it I mean death, death it, with certain conditions, it's reasonably foreseeable, albeit not in the not in the sort of time frames that we see in the Oregon type bill with the six months. But yeah, we uh, uh, my death my decision. Um, our campaign is very much for that for that broader law. Kathy, um, somebody's asking a question about Wales, saying if healthcare is devolved, why isn't assisted dying? Um, it's a matter for justice, not healthcare. Um, certain things are devolved to, to Wales, um, that we don't have the same level of devolution that Scotland does, or, or uh, certainly some of the Crown dependencies. So unfortunately, it's not within the remit of the Senate. I believe if it was, um, we would be in a different position. I think we would be keeping up with our, our um, neighbours in, in Scotland and Isle of Man and Jersey. There's certainly strong will uh, within the Senate to change the law on this, but unfortunately uh, their hands are tied. It's not devolved. Um, we've just closed actually a constitutional reform review, uh, which is going on at the moment in Wales to look at what we should be seeking to change about the way Wales is governed. Um, and uh, certainly in our response from Humanist UK, we did suggest that we challenge Westminster to say if they're not going to represent the, the will of the people of Wales, then perhaps that should be considered that we should have a similar sort of respect to devolution that are, there are, is in other parts of the UK. Now, I don't know which of you would like to take up the next one, um, perhaps several of you. Who are the principal opponent groups or bodies who are arguing against these proposals? I think, Trevor, you were suggesting that there may be some shenanigans going on in terms of this phony consultation where, uh, you know... Yeah, I, I, can't, um, I can't say that that's definitely happened, but 63,000 does sound an astonishing number of, of uh, individual survey responses. Um, there are um, various groups opposed. I suppose the most well known is called Care Not Killing. Um, and the, there is also the Christian Medical Fellowship. Um, and there is um, an all party parliamentary group called Dying Well, I think it's called, uh, which is a, around which coalesce various uh, opponents, including one Danny Kruger MP, who you may have seen in the recent Channel 4 documentary with his uh, mother Prue Leith taking different sides. Um, one thing that I find frustrating is that there are people who take up things like 
you know, oppression of the vulnerable and so on as their reasons for objecting, even though when you look around the world where, as Cathy said, we've had assisted dying for decades, this hasn't become a phenomenon. But in truth, I think behind that lies, in some cases, um, religious belief. Um, and so I do respect people like Ian Paisley, who will actually say, I don't believe in assisted dying because my Bible tells me so. You know, I know how I can deal with that. And so can the rest of the population in deciding whether they want an assisted dying law. But when people pick up ideas to sort of scare people, which actually aren't really well founded. I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of um, opposition that put out reports in the media which are not um, fully fact checked, let's say. <laughs> Um, so we, you know, we we um, rub along, but we we're confident from the public opinion polls that actually somewhere around eighty plus percent uh, of the public support an assisted dying law. I mean, certainly we've seen in the Lords and elsewhere a lot of people who have been long term uh, campaigners against assisted dying, not revealing deliberately, not revealing their religion, and actually sending messages to each other saying. Don't say that you're religious. Find other <laughs> use anything you can, but don't say religion because, as we know now, there is a you know minority of people who who call themselves religious, and um, so it's um, you know it tends to put people off. But I do think it's quite disingenuous of them to try and disguise the real reasons for their beliefs. Perfectly, you know, as, as humanists, we stand with Voltaire, a strongly believe people should have a right to have whatever beliefs they like, but simply not to impose them on anybody else. And they're doing it rather secretively. Michael. I want to add to what Trevor said. The research also shows that a majority of ordinary rather than mill man in the street Christians, practicing Christians, are in favor of assisted dying. It's only the, the bishops and the other leaders who won't catch up with their flocks on this matter. Yeah, quite right. Any of the others want to come in on this? I don't know what experience you've had in Scotland of opposition. I mean, there are, you know, there are strong religious sentiments in the Protestant and Catholic wings of Scottish society who may have strong views on this. Thanks, Polly. Yeah, this time the responses to the bill consultation were very much from um, faith groups or people using faith as their explanation for why they were opposed to the bill. That is a shift from when previously we've seen uh, medical professionals and groups um, perhaps opposed to the legislation. This time we're getting support from them, which is uh, which is really encouraging. Um, just to go very briefly back to the previous point about widening um, the scope of the bill from terminally ill, have absolutely empathy for, for that perspective. Um, however, what we're finding is that we're getting support for the definition as we're drawing it, and we haven't had support in the past from MSPs. So we really want to see this legislation um, pass over the line. Thanks. And as somebody's asking here about whether the change of first minister is going to affect the progress of the bill. Well, we know we have two people of faith uh, standing for the for the job. Um, do you think that'll impact on it at all? The question uh, all across Scotland at the moment, who is the new uh, FM going to be? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, interesting question. Um, what we're expecting with this bill, however, is that it will be a conscience vote. So it will be down to the individual MSPs, whether they support or don't support the bill as it is proposed. Obviously, it's helpful if there's a first minister who's in support, because for one thing, that's an additional vote. Um, but it's not crucial for the legislation to pass. Here's somebody asking. How ready are we for a change in the law? Does that, I mean, perhaps in practical terms or in in, in what terms? Um, let's let's take it. Let me take it any way you want. You know, if 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 the law were changed, what would we have to do to prepare for it? Can I come in on that one, Polly? Um, I think when we talk about the change in law, it's good to look at what Victoria in Australia are doing and that they've set themselves a, a, a change in the law, but two years upon which to, to get it right and make sure they look at all of the correct safeguards to have in place. They're not jumping into an instant change, um, but giving themselves that two year, uh, two year scope in which to change it. Now, if we look at what has happened in Jersey, which obviously Michael is much more an expert on than, than us, they've spent the last couple of years going in extreme detail as to uh, what the 
process should look like, what the safeguards should be, and they've consulted widely on it. It's They've done such an immense piece of work that for England and Wales, hopefully we'll be able to lean on that work um, and utilise the expertise that they've come up with. But this isn't something that we would enter into lightly. We're looking at making sure we get the process right and giving ourselves the time to train and test and make sure those safeguards are fit for purpose. Uh, just to follow up on that, um, Canada, as uh, Cathy was explaining, uh, uh, the way I put it is they were <clears throat> running before they could walk <clears throat> because the catalyst was a court case. It wasn't the gestation of legislation. And um, the the Canadian made practitioners who are led by Dr. Stephanie Green are very happy to say that they think w what's happened in Victoria by postponing the start date is the right way to go. Because what happened over there was that they they had to implement this law but they didn't they didn't have the protocols written so it's developed on a province by province basis no mandatory training etc so i think we need to prepare for it uh and frustrating though it would be to for it to be deferred for say 18 months or something that's got to be um a price worth paying to get it right michael have you been involved in the in the preparation process well, yes. I mean, the, the, recently they published uh, proposals. Um, uh, as I said in, in in my little speech earlier, pretty much like a white paper you might have in the UK, uh, laying out what they would do. Uh, much of which is very sane. Some of which I feel is quite wrong. But th this is there there for consultation, and so we have um, we we've you know, we put in our replies. Now they want two months to think about that and redraft it. So it's, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a careful process and I respect the people who are doing it. And I'm hopeful that it'll come out something nearer to right than it is at the moment, at any rate, let's say that. <laughs> well, as a warning, what are the things that seem to be not quite right? Well, for me, the thing that's not quite right is that the, the Jersey proposals um, propose two routes to assisted dying. If you have a six months to live prognosis, you're on route one. And if, if you don't, but are, quote, only suffering unbearably, you're on route two. Now, route two has a lot of extra um, problems to it. Do you have to go... You know, convince a tribunal and you have to you know, delays and hurdles to, to, to go through. Um, all this, they say, because um, unbearable suffering is, is subjective, which is philosophically absolutely balderdash. So I, I got um, a philosophy professor from Johannesburg who is co-founder of an international uh, uh, body to do with medical um, um ethics and and philosophy to to write to them and say no 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 um uh, unbearable pain it may be subjective but it but it has a certain certainty so if you if you go to your dentist and because you've got really bad toothache and he he does x or y and says does it still hurt and you say no if that dentist says to you, well, oh, but that's only subjective, um, I'm sorry, I don't quite believe you, you change your dentist. The only, the only person who knows whether they are suffering is the sufferer. And the only person, a doctor can, can tell us whether they're suffering from a condition that impacts on, on, on their health, on, their, on their, their life in any other way, but uh, that causes suffering. A doctor can tell us whether that condition is 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 uh, curable by by modern medical science or not but only the sufferer can say whether the suffering is unbearable no, no tribunal can can pronounce on that at all and the jersey the, the fault in the jersey proposals is that they want to bring in a tribunal to say whether somebody really is suffering unbearably it's a nonsense so we're we're hoping to get rid of that Thank you. Uh, question again for you, Emma. Um, how long do you have to, will you have to live in Scotland before qualifying? Or is it, are we going to have a sort of Gretna Green situation, except not for marriage, but for death? 
uh, a bit less romantic, perhaps. Um, yeah, so the, the plan is that you would need to live in Scotland and be registered with a GP for 12 months before you were able to enter into the process. Right. So you're not going to become the latest dignitas. No, that's right. Yeah, we wouldn't be, um, you couldn't visit us from somewhere else to access an assisted death. I wonder why, though. Why Why not? I mean, nobody turns on the Swiss for allowing people to, to come and make use of their law. Surely the ideal situation is where every jurisdiction has its own laws. I know that Sylvan Luli of Dignitas w w would love to, people to stop coming to Switzerland not because he doesn't want to help them, but because he wishes they all could obtain their rights to an assisted death in their own home. Yeah. And, and obviously, um, uh, that must be better. Uh, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, now, somebody is bringing up the question of the dreaded slippery slope. Slippery slope argument, everything, everything about us, every bit of legislation is always a slippery slope to somewhere, if you look at it that way. But for some reason, this is particularly applied to this question. Trevor, you want to answer? Um, yeah, it's only because it, I'm reminded of um, Debbie Purdy wrote an amazing memoir called It's Not Because I Want to Die. Um, and in that, she said, in, in relation to this argument, she said, Look, we are on the slope. We have the crampons. The only people who can move us are the politicians. So when these politicians say slippery slope, the answer is we're in a democracy where you would have to change the law, um, which happens in democracies from time to time. But you would be able to be the guardians to make sure it didn't happen if you didn't want it to. So it, the and, and also, if you look at other jurisdictions, someone, uh, Kathy, I think, mentioned Oregon. I mean, they've had their law for... 22 plus years, 25 years, and um, bar one change, which was related to um, allowing someone to um, waive the final period if they if it was feared that they were going to die in the next 14 days. You know, that's seems pretty reasonable to me. But apart from that, you know, it hasn't changed in 25 years. So this idea that all of these countries are sort of moving down a slope and, and the, the idea that it's down a slope is is a, a immediately a value judgment because some people might say well when the right time comes it should be expanded but of course what people mean is something a little bit more subtle than a another ratcheting of the law what they mean is ah um, old people are going to feel that they're a burden and they know they have this choice they're or they're going to want to preserve their inheritance or their greedy children are going to tell them you don't want to go into a home mum it's going to cost an awful lot of money uh you know here's another option i think it's i think it's that subtle more subtle sense uh that uh, what people really fear do, do you want to come in on that kathy yeah i think I, I wonder how much truth there is, actually is in that, though, because the safeguards would be so stringent and so clear and such a well laid down process as there already is operating around the world and that we can learn from those that there really isn't um, the, the potential for that. Um, so the only argument left, rather than opponents saying they don't believe in personal autonomy and the right to choose when you die if you're intolerably suffering. The only argument they have is perhaps misinformation and scaremongering. Um, and that's the sort of thing that, that does concern people. But when you lay out the process, you lay out the safeguards and you lay out that this is about personal choice of the individual, that argument goes away. We've only got a couple of, one minute, we we'll last one last question, which is the dread question. Should we have a referendum? To which my answer is, don't let's ever have a referendum again. <laughs> what we know about referendums is the abuse, the misinformation. There was on the voting system, on AV, outrageous misinformation. They were just cutting their teeth, the very same people who ran the Brexit referendum. So as far as I'm concerned, a referendum on this would be a, a, a festival of misinformation, of, of fear and, and dishonesty and social media lies. I don't know, any of you think a referendum's a good idea? 
no 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 right no to that <laughs> well that's the end of the session um thank you all very much for coming thank you very much to our, our excellent speakers um it's you know really been i think incredibly encouraging to hear how places more progressive than england are doing much better you know as ever england is the drag anchor on so much that goes on so it's very encouraging to hear that others are pushing ahead and um, maybe England will catch up, which is, is very good news. And as I say, do remember these groups all need your help and support. So please do join up and uh, offer your support. So we'll say goodbye to everybody now and uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>